Hello, and welcome to Weird Wild World, a weekly series that takes a look at the power of nature. From natural disasters to rare and strange phenomena and to animals, we'll take a look at the wonder and weirdness of our planet. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about Deception Island in Antarctica. Deception Island is not too far from the southernmost tip of South America, just for reference. It's not to say that it's within swimming distance or anything, but that's about the closest point I can compare it to for any of you that aren't exactly familiar with the Antarctic landscape. Anyway, with such a cool name like Deception Island, I knew that this island was going to have a unique history and I wanted to dive into it and see what was going on there. So let's take a look at Deception Island. Deception Island, according to one source, has fire and ice in its history and in the present day. Mountainous, half covered by glaciers and mostly covered with black volcanic ash, Deception is an active volcano. The island is a submerged caldera, a circle of craggy hills around an almost enclosed seawater lagoon known as Port Foster. Its horseshoe shape formed when a volcanic eruption 10,000 years ago blew off the top of the mountain and allowed seawater to flood the center or caldera. This volcano is quiet, but not dead. The island is classified as a restless caldera with significant volcanic risk that could erupt at any time. A caldera, for those of you that don't know, is a large depression that forms when a volcano erupts and collapses. During an eruption, magma from the magma chamber is expelled, usually with some force. When the magma chamber is empty, the sides and top of the volcano collapse inward, making a caldera. At least that's one of the most common simplified ways this works. Deception Island, which is horseshoe shaped, is exactly that, just a large caldera. It's been called one of the most incredible islands on the planet for its unique formation, shape, and history. It's one of the only places in the world where you can literally sail directly into the center of a restless volcano. And now I've got something new to add to my bucket list that I will most certainly never check off. As for its size, Deception Island's total land area is about 100 kilometers. It's 15 kilometers in diameter and rises 539 meters above sea level. Almost 60% of the island is covered by permanent glaciers. However, some other sources have different numbers. So if you've heard otherwise, I apologize. Sources don't totally agree on these numbers, but around 60%. As for the nature on the island, it's actually thriving. One National Geographic article goes into this in great depth, and I was surprised to see how much life and beauty there really is in this place. It's not just a hunk of rock and ice. I mean, well, a lot of it is, but it's a really fascinating hunk of rock and ice. Acacia Johnson, a photographer and naturalist who works as a guide for quark expeditions in Antarctica, says the island's name comes from the very narrow, easy to miss opening into the caldera known as Neptune's Bellows. The island appears solid from the outside until that opening is found and it is discovered to be a flooded caldera, she says. It's an amazing passage to sail through with walls of rock rising up on both sides. There is also a submerged rock right in the middle of the channel that has caused many a shipwreck. It's still on my bucket list, but that's good to know. I can't imagine that would be a good place to be stranded. According to another source that talks about the nature on Deception Island, there's 18 species of moss or lichen on the island that have not been recorded anywhere else in the Antarctic, two of which are endemic. It states bluntly that no other area in the Antarctic is comparable. Nine species of seabird breed on the island and the world's largest colony of chinstrap penguin are located at Bailey Head, a spot on the Southwest coast where an estimated 100,000 pairs nest. On this site, Deception Island, there's multiple clips from videographer David Cothran that show the sea life around the island as well. I highly recommend you check out some of these underwater clips if this is something that interests you. I've definitely been watching a couple of them and it, doesn't really deter me. It definitely makes me want to still visit here. I won't pretend like these are incredibly high quality, glamorous shots of coral reefs or anything, but it's definitely not something I expected to see in Antarctica and from essentially a flooded volcano. Catherine says numerous species of sponges and cidians and echinoderms are visible. This wall is one of the richest and most beautiful underwater sites I have seen around the Antarctic Peninsula. And in another clip, he says, on the unconsolidated cinder slopes, which make up the bottom of Port Foster, marine communities are quite depauperate, consisting of numerous individuals of a very few species. 
Here on a slope adjacent to Hephaestus Wall, the cinders are covered in thousands of brittle stars. The National Geographic photographer shares a similar love of the place. It's a photographer's dreamland, she says. There are old decaying buildings and rusting structures that people love to photograph, a rare time when we can see and understand traces of human presence and industry in the Antarctic region. The island's black sand beach is geothermally heated, so at low tide, clouds of steam rise from the shore. Johnson says she's actually been swimming there because the water along the shoreline is quite hot within the first six feet of the shore. All right, so as much as I'm fascinated by this place, this isn't a sales pitch telling you to visit there and it's not sponsored by the island, I promise. We've got a lot of history to discuss. So from now on, I've got a feeling for what Deception Island is. So let's get into how humans ruined, well, I mean, discovered it, I suppose. The first authenticated account of someone traveling to the islands is in 1820. According to the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, the east coast of the island was chartered by Bransfield in 1820. The name was first recorded by Palmer USA in 1820 and refers to the deceptive nature of this ring-shaped island with its central harbor, a breached and drowned volcanic crater. The island was chartered by sealers in 1820 to 1821 and by Russia in 1821. Volcanic eruptions in December 1967, February 1969, and August 1970 caused considerable damage to the topography of the island. And we'll get to the volcanic eruptions in a little, but for now, let's focus on the 1800s. What happened once it was discovered? Well, according to some sources, several research bases were established here, though scientific experiments were conducted by the British as early as 1828. Sealers were said to be attracted to the area because it was a perfect natural harbor. In the South Shetland Islands, the group of islands Deception is a part of, the sealing industry exploded and massive overhunting meant that the furs of seals neared extinction in the South Shetlands within a few years of its inception. By 1825, it was abandoned once again. So, you know, this gorgeous island was overhunted, the seals there were brought to near extinction, and then people left. It's a bit depressing to say the least. But people weren't done with Deception Island yet. Although one source said that British expeditions took place as early as 1828, this source claims it was 1829 and reads, the first scientific expedition to Antarctica led by the British captain Henry Foster visited aboard HMS Chanticleer in 1829. Lieutenant Kendall compiled a map of Deception Island, the first accurately surveyed map of an Antarctic landmass. In 1842, William Smiley of the U.S. sealing vessel Ohio gave the first account of a volcanic eruption on Deception Island. Not very much is known or said about this volcanic activity in 1842. One source says that eruptions took place in 1790, 1828, and 1842, but these were either very minor or very few people took note of the events because there's not really much to be said of these eruptions. As far as I can tell, this ends the first sort of phase of human activity from the island. From 1842 to the early 1900s, there's no mention of the island anywhere. So for now, let's skip forward a bit when whalers entered the picture. Now, it's no secret that Deception Island is known for having hosted whalers, one part of its so-called Whalers Bay, and there's a place called Whalers Cemetery on the island, the largest cemetery in Antarctica. It was around 1906 when the whaling activities began. Norwegian Adolphus Andersen used Whalers Bay as an anchorage for whaling factory ships. Between 1908 and 1910, the French explorer Jean-Baptiste Carcot visited to stock up with coal, food, and water, and to make repairs to his vessel. In 1912, the Hector Whaling Company was issued with a license to establish a shore-based whaling station. Approximately 150 people worked at the station during the Austral summer, producing over 140,000 barrels of whale oil. Hector Whaling Station was abandoned in April 1931 when whale oil prices slumped. The remains of Hector Whaling Station, a whaler's cemetery, and Base B, partially destroyed by a volcanic eruption in 1969, are now protected as Antarctic Treaty Historic Site and Monument Number 71. Again, we'll get to those eruptions in just a moment. There is a Whaler's Bay conservation strategy online if you want to see more information about it, so at least conservation efforts are underway now, even if they weren't back then. Whaler's Bay, for instance, is on the east side of Port Foster on Deception Island. 
There's 35 burials and a memorial to 10 men lost at sea at the cemetery there. PBS called it an Antarctic whaling boomtown at the time. Boomtown sounds a bit extreme to me as it's not really like this place had many people living out there at all, but I guess for Antarctica standards, I guess you could say that. They state, the whole place has a haunted feel, said William Brangham, a PBS NewsHour correspondent. Bleached out whale skeletons sit on the beach, not too far from the huge hulking round tanks that once held thousands of gallons of whale oil. Now they just sit there, rusted and empty. When those tanks were built in the early 20th century, Deception Island hosted hundreds of men who spent the Southern summers harpooning and butchering whales, rendering their blubber and boiling their bones and meat to take full advantage of the oil the animals produced. Bloody red runoff and the stench from the flensing plant attracted flocks of birds before their food source disappeared. Since processing whales into oil required so much fresh water, some crews dug up wells on the island and others manned boats that would tow melting ice from nearby glaciers to the factory ships and land-based whaling station. All this occurred for years until the invention of offshore whaling in 1925 spelled the end of operations on Deception Island. It didn't stop instantly, but as we said earlier, the place was essentially abandoned again by 1931. Populations of whales, especially humpbacks, were once again a common sight near Deception Island, and other species of whale are returning to the area. Honestly, this is yet another thing I find fascinating about Deception Island. It's sort of come and gone, and it's had phases of interest over the years from humans. I don't condone whaling, but it's interesting to me how little pieces of history are all over the place here. In 1928, Australian Hubert Wilkins and Canadian Carl Ben Eilson undertook the first powered flight in Antarctica, taking off from an impoverished ash runway at Whalers Bay. In 1935, Lincoln Ellsworth assembled his aircraft, the Polar Star, on the island, and an early aerial survey expedition took place from 1955 to 1957. That's not all though. Aside from whaling, there's also been those who want to take Deception Island for themselves entirely. There's been political tension over who Deception Island actually belongs to. And in 1944, Operation Tabarin, a secret British wartime mission, established its first base in the once abandoned Hector whaling station. In 1948, Argentina built on the island and in 1955, so did Chile. The British, it seemed, were the least accepting with other people using this island. Understandably so at times, they didn't want the Germans using it as a base in World War II. The Antarctican society reads, Germany was known to use remote islands as rendezvous points and as shelters for raiders, U-boats, and supply ships. Also in 1941, there had been a fear that Japan might attempt to seize the Falkland Islands, either as a base or hand them to Argentina, thus gaining political advantage for the Axis and denying their use to Britain. Deception Island in the British South Shetland Islands possessed a sheltered anchorage with an old Norwegian whaling station. In 1941, the British aboard HMS Queen of Bermuda had taken the precaution of destroying coal dumps and oil tanks there to prevent their possible use by the Germans. One source even says that the HMS Caravan Castle arrived at the island in the early 40s. It was the British trying to wipe out signs of the Argentinians who were sympathetic to the Germans in World War II. Apparently, Carnivon Castle, under the command of Edward Kitson, arrived on Deception Island in January, 1943. Here, a group of sailors were sent ashore to remove all marks of sovereignty left on the island by Argentinians from the vessel Primo de Mayo of the previous year. With this successfully completed, the ship then sailed onto the South Orkneys, hoisting a British flag on Signy Island and inspecting an Argentine meteorological station on Lori Island. Argentina had been interested in Deception Island for quite some time though. They returned in 1948 and even built huts in the early 1950s, along with the Chileans, along the improvised runway we mentioned earlier. One accident in 1958 between an Argentine naval vessel and the Scottish whaling ship Southern Hunter only added more tensions to the situation. And in 1961, the Argentinian president, Arturo Frondizi, visited the island. All three, to some extent, claimed the island. And all three, whether it's British, the Argentinians, or the Chileans, have a history of activity there. Three places had operating stations there, and for a time, that was as much activity as the island saw. Sealing, whaling, and bases. 
really says something with how we treat a natural wonder in Antarctica. And it's a bit disheartening if you think about it. But moving on, what changed things drastically was of course the volcanic eruptions. The island it seems had enough of people using it for hunting and war and basically cleared everyone out again. No, that's not exactly what happened, but that was the end result. As hamilton.edu explains, during the 1920-21 whaling season, water in Whalers Bay began to boil and removed paint from the hulls of ships anchored there. In 1930, the floor of the harbor dropped five meters during an earthquake. 1967 saw two volcanic eruptions that forced the evacuations of the Argentinian, British, and Chilean bases and destroyed the Chilean base. In 1969, the British base was damaged during an eruption and another eruption occurred in 1970. The active volcanism of the island provides geothermally heated water that percolates through the volcanic beach sand and makes it possible to swim in the harbor's water or with some work, dig a hot tub in the sand and enjoy a warm bath. Given the fact that Deception Island is pretty much a half sunken volcano, this doesn't really surprise me. Well, not the boiling water part anyway, but how would an eruption happen on Deception Island when the volcano seems to be underwater? Maybe that's a really stupid question and I need to go back to science class, but hey, I was curious, but apparently I'm not alone though, because one source has even called it the Antarctic volcano that just doesn't make any sense. Only two volcanoes in Antarctica are active, at least as of the article when it was written in 2015. Mount Everest, south of New Zealand, has been erupting continuously over the past few decades, but Deception Island is known for the largest eruption in the Antarctic area. Supposedly, even though all three areas, the UK, Chile, and Argentina have some sort of lay of claim to it, The eruption in 1967 and 1969 at Deception Island were, quote, remarkable failures in the history of volcano monitoring. The volcanic events at Deception fall into a rare category called subglacial eruptions. The island is situated in a place where there is a glacier on the ocean floor about 100 meters thick. Scientists would normally expect that if it were hit by lava from below, it would evaporate benignly into steam. But the lava moving upwards at Deception has several qualities that made things happen differently. It moves slowly and it has high water content. That meant it turned the glacier into meltwater as well as steam, creating a large overflow of mud to the surface. This was the main cause of the destruction of the UK and Chilean stations. The reason why this melting was unexpected was because in scientific terms, the glacier was deceptively thin, which quite fitting for Deception Island if you ask me. The scientists were not expecting it to produce much more than steam. Ironically, the absence of larger glaciers is what made the island the most hospitable location in Antarctica. Now, many volcanoes are caused by something called subduction, when Earth's tectonic plates crash and one plate is sent down and the other is pushed upwards. This is what created the sort of infamous ring of fire in the Pacific. Many at sea, such as Hawaii and the Azores are hotspots. These are caused by holes in the ocean floor where there's a direct line to Earth's mantle. This is the same of submerged calderas. Look at those located in Japan. So it makes sense that this would be how Deception Island works, right? For a while, scientists even thought that Deception Island might be an unusual type of seduction, but it's called Deception Island for a reason. A more recent hypothesis is that the South Shetland Islands are on what we call a rift zone. Another example of this is Iceland, where instead of plates colliding, there are gaps from them moving away from each other, creating a new volcanic crust in the process. A scientific report explains Deception Island, South Shetland Islands, is one of the most active volcanoes in Antarctica, with more than 20 explosive eruptive events registered over the past two centuries. Recent eruptions, 1967, 1969, and 1970, and the volcanic unrest episodes that happened in 1992, 1999, and 2014 to 2015, demonstrate that the occurrence of future volcanic activity is a valid and pressing concern for scientists, technical and logistic personnel, and tourists that are visiting or working on or near the island. Important efforts have been made to understand the magmatic and volcanic evolution of DI and the nature of the underlying magmatic sources and their relation to the geodynamic setting. However, a detailed evolutionary model of the island's magma plumbing system has never been provided. As a consequence, even if an eruption on DIA is certain to occur in the near future, the timescale and characteristics of that volcanic activity still remain unclear. This paper also discusses the Bransfield Rift and as Deception Island is located in the Bransfield Strait, it would make sense that this is a possibility. I won't pretend like I perfectly understand the figures of the plates within their model, 
but to some extent, I can see the Antarctic plate and its distance between the Scotia plate where the rift is located. We may struggle to predict exactly what happens in this underwater volcano, but if we better understand the Bransfield rift, then there's at least a chance, right? This source claims, as revealed by regional geochemical data, DI's magma signature indicates a mantle source similar to the one feeding the Bransfield Rift areas of subalkaline composition and with little subduction influence. So let's take a look at the Bransfield Rift from this source and who's written a book about it. According to the Back Arc Basin's books from Springer Link, Bransfield Strait is a marginal basin landward of the South Shetland Trench. It lies between South Shetland Islands and the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and is an example of an extensional basin formed by rifting within continental volcanic arc. The Antarctic Peninsula is the product of at least 200 million years of subduction. The observed extension seems to be confirmed to Bransfield Strait, which is bounded by the landward projections of the Hero and Shackleton fracture zones. The present extension in Bransfield Rift started less than 4 million years ago and possibly less than 1.5 million years ago, following the demise of the Antarctic Phoenix Spreading Center. The amount of trench rollback should be comparable to the amount of extension in Bransfield Strait. The Bransfield Basin, the Black Arc Rift Basin extends for 310 miles. So to try and simplify here, it's believed that the South Shetland Islands formed because of subduction 200 million years ago. However, When the Phoenix Plate stopped subducting under the Antarctic Plate around 4 million years ago, the extension that created the base began. Some surveys say the extension happened 1.8 million years ago at a rate of 1 tenth to 3 tenths of an inch every year. Some say there's slab rollback too. Seriously, there's a lot to this. I don't wanna get too deep into these rifts since it'll start getting a little more scientific than I can really understand and break down. So let's get back to basics of what Deception Island is even up to these days. Today, the island hosts two scientific stations operating yearly during the austral summer season, and it's one of the most popular tourist destinations in Antarctica with over 15,000 visitors per year. And oh yes, I heard that, visitors. I wanna be on that list. On the outside perimeter of the island's circle, exposed to the sea is the world's largest colony of chinstrap penguins. Nearly 400,000 birds live there, but it's strictly off limits to visitors. In 2004, a bright orange plane fuselage, one that belonged to the Royal Air Force was recovered. And then in 2006, a Russian cruise ship ran aground there. They were luckily rescued by a Spanish Navy icebreaker that was currently on support duty in Antarctica. The area is undoubtedly dangerous. I've got to wonder if the ship had issues because of the large rock in the center, the National Geographic photographer mentioned that's like just beneath the water. But speaking of her though, I wanted to end today on a note from her. Though visits to the island may not be easy as winds in excess of 46 miles per hour can force people to cancel their plans, it also seems well worth the journey. As you watch, it's as if every corner of the landscape is subtly moving with life. Yet inside the caldera, just on the other side of the mountains, you'd sworn you'd never seen such a desolate place, she says. Plus the penguins had recently hatched their chicks, so the whole colony was brimming with new life. The change happened in a matter of minutes and exemplified one of the reasons I love traveling to Antarctica, she says. Things are always changing, reminding us of how powerful the landscape actually is, reminding us of our place within it, how small and insignificant we really are. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Weird Wild World. I hope you enjoyed this look at Deception Island because I know I absolutely did. And if you did, make sure to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening to this so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you'd like to connect with me outside of the episodes, you can check the description box for my Linktree link, which will hold all of my links for all of my social media and other projects and things that I'm associated with. So again, thank you all so much for making it to another episode. Love you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.